The deserts are the laboratories of the future for how most of us will have to survive on this planet as it becomes hotter and drier. Climate change is more than drought. It's heat waves and it's salinity and it's crumbling infrastructure and it's uncertainty. And so that's why having a, a diverse set of beverages that we rely upon based on a diverse set of plants and, and yeast is really important. Welcome to the Organic Wine Podcast. Hello, this is Adam Huss coming to you from Los Angeles. Thanks for listening. Gary Paul Nabhan is an agriculture ecologist, ethnobotanist, ecumenical Franciscan brother, and author of over 30 books. His work is focused primarily on the interaction of biodiversity and cultural diversity in the arid binational Southwest. He is considered a pioneer in the local food movement and the heirloom seed-saving movement. A first-generation Lebanese-American, Navhan was raised in Gary, Indiana, and he worked at the headquarters for the first Earth Day in Washington, D.C. Gary has achieved numerous degrees, including a Ph.D. in the Interdisciplinary Arid Lands Resource Sciences, and he has received numerous awards and medals, including a MacArthur Fellowship. He co-founded Native Seeds, a nonprofit organization which works to preserve place-based southwestern agricultural plants, and he did the research to help create Ironwood Forest National Monument. He now serves as the Kellogg Endowed Chair in Southwestern Borderlands Food and Water Security at the University of Arizona, where he founded the Center for Regional Food Studies and catalyzed the initiative to have UNESCO designate Tucson as the first city of gastronomy in the U.S. Despite all this, I only came to hear about Gary when Ricky Taylor of Altamarfa forwarded me an article about Gary's intra-institutional work to catalog and preserve the rich diversity of Mexico's traditional fermented beverages. Maybe this shows my need to broaden my scope, or maybe it shows the power of these fermented beverages to capture attention. I'll let you decide. Regardless, I'm so grateful to have discovered the wealth and wisdom of this guy, Gary Paul Napan, and I'm thrilled to be able to share him with you. I can't think of a better episode for Thanksgiving holiday than this conversation with Gary. Thank you for caring about the things we discuss on this podcast, and happy Thanksgiving. Enjoy! Uh, Gary, welcome. Thank you so much for joining. It's really an honor to be able to have this conversation with you. Well, it's a joy for me too. So thank you and thank your listeners. And, you know, like I said, I'm I'm kind of sad to say that I, I just found about you and your body of work recently, um, but it, it, I've really connected personally with so much of what you've had to say uh, that I've discovered already. And um, the, you know, the way that I, that my sort of entree to you and your work was this article titled Biodiversity in a Bottle, Uncovering Mexico's Traditional Fermented Beverages. And of course, I'm very into fermented beverages. <laughs> um, and and this is about how you and a, a multi-institutional team of academics and scientists, it sound like, are researching and actually mapping the diversity of and cultural history of uh, traditional Mexican fermented beverages. That's a good and summary. Is... And I want to say <laughs> that term biodiversity in a bottle really applies to fermented beverages, uh, both in the United States and Mexico, um, more than any food and beverage I can think of that uh, the large variety of bacterial strains and yeasts that winemakers and uh fermentation artisans in Mexico are using have really sort of opened up uh, the bottle that the genie had closed for a number of centuries. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love that. Well, that's a good tease. And and I'll give my own personal context to you, which is, you know, I've lived in Los Angeles for 25 years now and have, you know, seen repeatedly worsening droughts happening in California over that time. And, uh, and it, over that same time, we've kind of gotten to know and fall in love with wine and learned how grapes are grown. And it just sort of dawned on me that maybe we should consider making wine from fruit that requires less water. Um, and, you know, so that's, that's where I sort of came. We, you know, we we're, we're making wine from uh, some prickly pear that we're foraging here in Los Angeles. And, and then I came across your study and was super excited to see, you know, I, I had already known that I was participating in a centuries old, you know, you know, 
millennial old traditions that far d dated far be before I had this bright idea. Um, and I just would love to give more context to that for everyone involved um, in, in wine for the same reason. But maybe before we jump into that, can can we get a little context about you and, and your life? You are a desert denizen, but you've had a pretty uh, amazing life of travels and research and studies and things that I, I will introduce. But if you could sort of, you know, maybe give us a little context to this and also just a little context to what led you to this study. Um, so maybe, you know, I guess what I'm asking for is your entire life story and the unabridged history of indigenous agriculture in North America. Well, let me Go. try to capsulize that because <laughs> I don't want to hear any snoring coming back <laughs> Uh, when this is played. Um, I'm an Arab American, and my uh, grandfather and his uh, brothers and cousins um, on the Lebanon-Syria border in the Bekaa Valley were uh, among the people, not just a few, but many people in Arab countries that have made both great wines and a distillate called Adak that's an anisette, much like the ouzo that probably more of your listeners uh, have tasted. Right. And right. so I've Grappa, looked at yeah. um, arid land winemaking, not only in Lebanon and Syria and uh, Morocco, Canary Islands, but in parts of Mexico and the U.S. as well. I live right by the U.S.-Mexican border uh, in Santa Cruz County, which has more wineries at mid-elevations, 4,000 to 5,500 feet than any other part of Arizona. And talking with the winemakers who are my neighbors, they're constantly grappling to uh, get varieties that can tolerate the heat, maybe mature later in the mm. summer and fall so that uh, all the uh, wonderful uh, sugars don't get concentrated without bringing the flavor along. And so right. I've, I've thought about... Uh, um, winemaking and other fermented beverages uh, for th 35 years uh, since I first lived in this county um, decades ago. And then more recently, I've become engaged with uh, the future of mezcal and tequila and the many fermented beverages that are made from those same iconic plants, uh, the agaves or century plants. And uh, I, I basically live a bilingual, binational, uh, bicultural kind of uh, life down here on the border. So I've been very attentive to the traditional fermented beverages in the northern Mexican deserts and have joined this team of Mexican scientists that are looking at the value of those probiotic beverages nationwide. I love that. Um, y you are described as an ethnobotanist. And I'm just curious if you can sort of give a sense of what that means. It's such a fascinating term to me. Well, the funniest way to say it, I guess, is that we keep our ears open to all the traditions of food and farming and medicine and beverage making that have emerged over thousands of years, rather than dismissing them and starting all over again from scratch that uh, there's incredible knowledge, traditional culinary uh, and ecological knowledge embedded in indigenous people's uh, work with plants and uh, the way they continue to use them today. And much of that knowledge is endangered because of the kind of um, marketing of soft drinks and uh, a few select uh, fermented beverages at the expense of all the others that have emerged culturally over thousands of years. So in my case, a lot of what I do is about ethnobotany for the future. We know that we're coming into a warmer, drier uh, era. And how can we learn from the desert peoples who've been dealing with those conditions for centuries, if not millennia, and already have solutions to some of the problems that the rest of us are now trying to deal with. Yeah, I love that. Can you, I mean, I, I, I'm struck by your sense of the the diversity of these beverages uh, when I, you know, just look at the, what we think of in America as the 
the fermented beverage landscape. It's like beer, wine, and spirits. Um, you know, and there's maybe three or four different kinds of spirits, maybe five. Um, what what kind of div- diversity have you found? Can you talk a little bit about that? You know, some of the data or just some of the findings. What kind of plants have been used? What you know, uh, what, what kind of beverages have been made? Sure, there's about sixteen distinctive types of fermented and probiotic beverages in Mexico and the U.S. Southwest. Keep in mind that there wasn't a border here till 150 right. years ago and that those uh, traditions occurred right where I'm living, uh, south of Tucson. But right. they include over 145 species of plants, uh, not just corn and wheat and barley that are used, of course, for um, a lot of distilled beverages and grapes uh, and uh, other fruits that are used for wines, but uh, they infuse many other fruits and nuts and herbs uh, in those fermented beverages. And what's astonishing is that some of these fermented beverages have dozens of yeast and uh, 50 to 100 kinds of uh, fermentation bacteria in them, where uh, many uh, young winemakers may just get a single strain of uh, brewer's yeast or or champagne yeast to start off their fermentation. These people are using pottery vessels or, or wooden barrels that uh, literally are drawing upon six to eight different genera of yeast, not just a single species like Saccharomyces cerevisiae. So both in terms of the plant uh, base or or raw materials and the number of yeasts that are being uh, in an interactive uh, way in the fermentation process, um, mezcal and tepache and tezuino and these other beverages far out distance any other beverages in the world for the variety of fermentation microbes in them. And so they're actually more like kimchi than they are like the beverages <laughs> that Europeans are used to. They have so many complex flavors and fragrances. Why? I mean, have you got to taste a lot of these? I have. And I've also made... Um, Many at my home, Sandor Katz, an art of fermentation author, did a workshop at my home uh, for about 70 people, uh, sort of outdoors, hands-on workshop on uh, fruit and beverage fermentation. And we took uh, pots, uh, large clay ollas or or pottery vessels from border tribes and um, used their roots that they use as catalysts for uh, fermentation, or I should say really regulators of fermentation, and um, tried them out with different um, uh, substrates of, of uh, fruits or, or native corns or uh, Spanish introduced wheats or uh, grapes. And uh, there's really a renaissance of interest in all of this. I've talked at the fermentation festival in uh, Wisconsin and other events like that in Arizona. And so I'm just one of hundreds of people in the Southwest states and thousands in Mexico that regularly make some of these things. Oh, that's great. So these are living beverages that have lots of probiotic microbial living activity happening, theoretically good for you, healthful for you potentially. Um, yes, they're too good just to study. I mean, uh, <laughs> one of those uh, guys that doesn't study anything unless I do it. <laughs> and the point is right. that that they're delicious, but what we know about probiotic beverages, including this iconic one that is m- made both with corn and uh, agaves or mezcal that's called tezuino, um, it's, it's much more healthful than the raw materials they're made from. Uh, you're releasing uh, not only flavors and fragrances through the, all the volatiles in them, but also amino acids that you can't find in the crop itself, but you can find in the fermentation vat. Oh, wow. Yeah. I, um, let's talk a sort of a bigger picture question. Why 
did these people create these fermented beverages? Do, I mean, do you have a sense that you know, did each have its separate that use? Was is there a ritual a use? Million dollar use question. No, I mean, <laughs> keep in mind that uh, people use clay pots for storage of uh, grains and fruits over centuries and millennia, and sometimes uh, the naturally occurring yeast and bacteria would just get into those pots. And then they'd use that same pot over and over if it had a really nice flavor to the beverages that came out of it. But they were used ceremonially too. We now think that uh, there was prehistoric distillation of agaves or century plants in Mexico, that it was not introduced from the new world to the new world uh, by the Spanish, that uh, uh, centuries before the Spanish and perhaps Asians arrived in uh, North America, there was a fermentation tradition, but it was micro distillation, just a a cup of um, distilled alcohol per uh, uh, head of agave. And that was probably used ceremonially. The Mm. uh, cactus beverages that I've um, drunk here in the Sonoran Desert of Arizona and adjacent Mexico are all used for rain bringing ceremonies during the summer. When we have a drought, they have these ceremonies to uh, call down the clouds and the rains. And so it's almost like a sacrament like wine is in the uh, Christian traditions. And so it has a special cultural role. These are not just commodities to the people who drink them. Right. The, there's, there may be some sacramental or I, I, is that the right term? Sacramental use, would it, you say for that kind of, it is true. We think of the Eucharist, a Christian tradition of uh, uh, bread and wine as a body and blood as the only sacramental use of a beverage, but uh, it's clear that there's analogs in indigenous uh, spirituality. And, do you have a have you have you had a favorite that you've experienced? Well, I'm going to mention three things uh, just quickly, okay. and we can talk in more detail about uh, that. Uh, there's uh, historic records going back to the 16th century that people fermented mesquite pods. Now, mesquite is a legume tree that has pods much like uh, carob or Saint John's bread from the old world. It's basically a big pod that. It's not the seed, but the pot itself that is cracked or ground and then fermented. And they bury that pot in the ground in Mexico. And this is described in the early documents. And it's sort of a musty mix. It almost looks like a gravy when they uh, put the pods in water and and then stir them. There's a lot of uh, flour-like must in it. But within two months of being in a sealed pot in the ground, it turns into a clear wine that's just extraordinary. And Mm. uh, people have also drunk uh, agaves like that, uh, not just as tequila or distilled mezcal, but they used to call all these products vino de mezcal or vino de mesquite. So Mm. there was probably widespread use of agaves and cactus fruits for fermented beverages well before anyone decided to distill them into the beverages that most people now associate with Mexico. And and are those, I mean, is the mesquite one one of your favorites? It is. It's just absolutely delicious. It's, it tastes almost like a Chardonnay, but has this hint of the smoky mesquite flavor that some of us associate with barbecue or, or uh, wood-fired right. steak. So it, it has this incredible uh, smoky aftertaste and is really delicious. I, I have to say that there's also some great uh, historic grape wines from Baja California and Sonora that are called Vino Generoso. And that is um, uh, a wine that's homemade It was also used uh, for uh, communion purposes. The Spanish probably introduced uh, this tradition, but it was used with the mission grape, the first 
grape that came into California, Arizona, and New Mexico. And it's still made today in Baja, California. One of the interesting things about that grape is that even though it's a dark blue purple grape, when you ferment it, all the color fades from it. And uh, you it it feels more like it, it looks in and to some extent tastes more like a white wine rather than a a, a tannin rich uh, red wine. Yeah, yeah, we we've got a lot of that going on here in Southern California too. I actually have a a cutting from an old pre prohibition vineyard growing in my backyard right now of a, a mission one of one of the old mission vines that had been neglected for you know a hundred years. Um, That's what I chose too. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. Now, so you do, you, you live on a a small acreage there, if I understand correctly. Is that right? That's right. We have four and a half acres of land and another acre of a pond. And around that I grow uh, about 140 different heirloom fruits and nut tree varieties from the deserts of all the world's continents. I, I've been collecting heirloom, uh, fruits for over 30 years. And so I grow 35 kinds of pomegranates and six kinds of quinces and five kinds of figs, et cetera, et cetera. And um, the ones I don't ferment, I make into uh, shrubs, the the, um, vinegar-based syrups. um, And I also uh, have a roasting pit for roasting the agaves and sotols uh, that are traditionally uh, pit roasted in this area um, for fermented beverages, not for distilled beverages. So if uh, right. alcohol guns and firearms are listening out there, my roasting pit is not for being a bootlegger. It's just for <laughs> fermented beverages. Right, right. Um, <laughs> that sounds like a full-time job with four acres of that many species. Is that <laughs> you have time to write and study? Well, I would say that uh, this summer when we had 25 inches instead of five inches of rain, like we had the year before, I was up to my elbows. That's a polite word, elbows in uh, <laughs> weeds. And I'm just now recovering from that. But I, I don't have many trees of each of those varieties, but I have about... Right easily an acre and a half to almost two acres of fruit trees scattered around our four acres. You said uh, something about a difference in rainfall. Could you repeat that? Yes. This is the one thing that all the winemakers have to contend with down here, that last year we had five inches of rainfall, less than one third of the average. And this year we had 25, five times as much as we had last year. So that's why most of the winemakers... Uh, in our county have 15 to 20 different varieties and they only sell blends really because you never know which varieties are going to do well and which aren't. I should mention that, that even with the mezcal makers in the deserts, oftentimes they're using five to 10 different species of agaves or century plants, not varieties, but entire species, you know, equivalent to grapes or wheat or barley. Um, in the single in a single fermentation uh, vat, or they're separately fermenting them and then blend them uh, after distillation. So blending uh, uh, grape varieties or or uh, agave varieties is really another strategy. There's very few single varietals. It sounds like uh, diversity is the strategy there. That's right. Not putting all your eggs in one basket is uh, the name of the game in deserts because of the climate uncertainty. And it, it does sound like this this research that you're doing, as fun as it may be and <laughs> and obviously interesting, ties really well into your history. I mean, you, you've been called the father of the local food movement. And it seems like, um, you know, I, I have that perspective of, as well as living in a place where so much of the food that we have available is trucked in from many places around the world and more and more that seems uh, unsustainable and looking for these, you know, finding these indigenous and traditional beverages uh, or any kinds of foods really just seems like the future of 
the survival of these urban centers in the Southwest. That's, Can you talk a, a little bit of how that, yeah, please. Oh, you're, you're right on target. I, I mean, um, I have been involved in the local food movement really since its beginning in the U S um, when uh, someone, uh, I was sort of horrified when I first heard someone call me the father of the local food movement, because <laughs> my wife said, there's something you haven't been telling me who's the mother. Um, but as I get older, I'm more involved in uh, local beverages <laughs> and local foods. And I think the wonderful thing is we have mixologists all over Tucson and Phoenix, just like in Mexico, that are using these uh, fermented beverages and shrubs in terrific cocktails. So there's Tezuino cocktails made with fermented corn, tepache, which is usually fermented pineapple with cinnamon and other spices in it. And those are all being mm. integrated into some great cocktails in California, Arizona, nearly every state in Mexico. Let me just say another thing about uh, what I call planet desert, that the deserts are the laboratories of the future for how most of us will have to survive on this planet as it becomes hotter and drier. And so from LA Basin over to El Paso, we're facing yield declines, uh, increasing production costs for uh, uh, beverage and food plants. And that's why we really need to pay attention to these desert adapted varieties and species, uh, because some of them use only a fifth of the water that is used for most conventional crops like corn. Yeah, I've just... Again, your work is really amazing uh, for anyone who wants to get a glimpse of where we're headed. Uh, I think, you know, your work over the last 40 years is now, you know, has never been more relevant. And I'm just wondering how you feel. I mean, you were in a way sounding the alarm about the climate emergency and our unsustainable agricultural system back in the 70s. And a lot of time has passed. And I'm, I'm just wondering what it's like to both you know, see some of that, some of the chickens come home to roost, so to speak, but also to have not been listened to, I think, in large part uh, over that time, while this is getting worse and worse. Well, the funny thing is that most of us who love to innovate have never been slowed down or impaired by people don't who don't get what we're doing. <laughs> There'd be no <laughs> innovation in the world if if uh, we just listen to the first person who said, that sounds really crazy. Are you sure that's going to work? <laughs> so the point is, I started talking about these issues in the late 1970s and early 80s. And I was way beyond the fringe of the agricultural community here. And as I get older, I guess, because I've stuck around and, and not uh, uh, died of poisoning of any of these crazy plants that I've tried, um, it's not like I get respect, but uh, people draw me into dialogues about these things, including many farmers who are looking for solutions. So I'm excited that just yesterday I was in a restaurant for lunch in Tucson, Arizona, and the drink that I had for lunch had both prickly pear cactus and uh, mesquite in it. And I thought, you know, I've lived long enough now where the things that I only dreamed of being in the marketplace are already in the marketplace. There's over 150 uh, native desert foods and beverages uh, produced by over 40 micro enterprises in the Tucson, Arizona area. And we're the first city of gastronomy in the United States to be designated by the United Nations for two reasons. One, we're innovating about how to live in a hotter, drier world. And two, we're the place with the oldest agriculture in the continental United States. 5,000 years of corn production, just a half mile away from where I have my office in Tucson. So there's a lot of hope that I have now because what we thought was pie in the sky, or we were told by critics was pie in the sky in the 1970s and 80s, uh, people have had to reconsider and implement because as we know, necessity is a mother of invention. <laughs> right. It, it does seem 
extremely necessary. Did that 25 inches do anything to the level of the Colorado River this year? No, it didn't. And that's a really interesting thing because farmers get drought relief payments. And this last year wasn't a drought year. They don't get climate change relief. <laughs> they right. they need to begin to use their drought payments to establish long-term measures that will help them deal with climate change. But climate change is more than drought. It's heat waves and it's salinity and it's crumbling infrastructure and it's uncertainty. And so that's why having a, a diverse set of beverages that we rely upon based on a diverse set of plants and and yeast is really important. And one yeast might do really well in high temperatures and another one in lower temperatures. So we also have to be selecting the ones that can survive uh, hot and dry. Well, I've heard you say, speaking of diversity, it seems like a, a really great theme that I'd, I'd love to talk to you about more. I, I've heard you say that we are all impoverished when we fall out of relationship with each other. And I, th- I feel like there's a growing lack of diversity in the kinds of relationships that we have in this country that we're, we're very often siloed in terms of mindset, in terms of uh, culture, and in so many other ways. And I'm wondering, you know, can, could you talk about that and how that's true, how, how important it is to maintain these diverse relationships, uh, both from biological relationships in the soil with humans and plants, as well as between each other? and uh, and the rest of nature? That's such a great question that's fundamental to my whole way of looking at the world. Let me try to unpack it first in the cultural part of that question. Um, I've been blessed by being of Arab origin and seeing the world through Arab eyes, not just Anglo eyes. But I've also worked on 20 uh, indigenous or Native American uh, reservations in the U.S. and Mexico where they don't think the way we do about plants, about the economy, or about farming. And I've learned so much from those people who allowed me to be their understudies in how to farm and uh, produce fruit and draw upon all the many uh, herbs that you can use to infuse beverages with. I wouldn't have had that if I just had a straight scientific uh, discipline is my only source of information. And so the studies of creativity that are being done worldwide say that people who are multilingual are often more creative in their problem-solving skills because they can do what's called cognitive switching. Instead of running into a roadblock because you only have one language or one way of looking at the world uh, to guide you, they can get around that roadblock by switching to another language and another cultural sensibility and other doors open up. And so this is really fundamental to how I think about the dilemma of climate change. We need solutions, but all those solutions are not going to come from academia or from top-down government programs. They're going to bubble up like a blessed ferment from the bottom, the grassroots, and infect and delight people of many cultures by this blessed ferment that comes when we interact with one another. So cultural diversity is as important to surviving and thriving under new climate regimes as the natural diversity of uh, grapes and fruits and grains that we've been talking about during this program. How how can food and, and wine, which I think of as food, help in this process? How, how does it well, build bridges? Or how could it be, build bridges? Well, first of all, uh, or, the basic idea of having diverse people coming together to share food and drink at a table is a way we most frequently understand other cultures when we have feasts together and change food and beverage Uh, traditions up to accommodate other people. The second part of that is that uh, these fermented foods and beverages from these traditions, they not only taste great, but they're really high in antioxidants and probiotics that help us overcome oxidative stress. 
which is um, one of the major sets of maladies and diseases that are hitting us uh, in the Western United States today, that farm workers and outdoor workers are now the most frequent people in emergency rooms other than COVID victims because of trying to work out in 120 degree weather. And that depletes all the antioxidants that are already in their body. And so it's like dehydration. It's it's metaphorically equivalent to that, that if you deplete all your antioxidants, your your metabolism has no way to be buffered from the, the heat and the uh, dryness. And so these fermented beverages, including all the resveratrols in wines, the antioxidants uh, that are so rich in, in uh, grape skins, are literally a way that will help us adapt to climate change. It's not just that we can um, get a little bit tipsy and say, well, I survived the day. But the, the antioxidants in our uh, wines are really helping us adapt to climate change. Oh, wow. <laughs> I mean, you know, because I needed an excuse to drink more. Thank you. Um, <laughs> we all do. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Oh, thanks. Um, well, you you wear so many hats, I, I would say. I mean, that's not even the right way to put it. There are so many ways that somebody could refer to you and your expertise. Is there is there a way that you are finding yourself drawn to now in your life uh, that is a is a main mode, or 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 is it the diversity of things that you are that is is the fun part? Well, I think I shed labels like rattlesnakes shed skins. I just have never <laughs> stayed in one mental or spiritual place long enough for a label to fit me very well. It's like a, a, a bad pair of pants after a while. I need another pair of pants so that I can walk uh, more comfortably. And so I, I really don't care what I'm called. I think a lot of my work is on that cusp that intersection, that inflection point between cultural diversity, biodiversity, and food diversity. And that's why I love the wonderful experimentation with diversity that's going on in the fermented food and beverage movements. And uh, winemakers are part of those. Uh, people who are infusing uh, their gins with local herbs uh, that that just kick the whole flavor profile of a gin up another notch compared to English gins. These innovations really matter in the long run, and they're fun. It's not just an academic or, or, or conceptual thing. It, these things really taste better and allow us to reflect on how diversity is important in every realm of our life. Yeah, I love that. I, I also... I'm really fascinated by your work with mesquite, or you wrote a book on mesquite um, in, in which you talk about arboreality. Can you talk about that concept? I'm... <clears throat> yeah. Uh, first of all, I think our agriculture is going to change more towards perennial plants uh, that are deep-rooted and leave carbon in the soil, and we'll see annual crops disappearing in many yeah. landscapes in Arizona, California, and elsewhere. And so mesquite is sort of like the tree of life of the desert. People get most of their firewood, building materials, medicines, and foods from uh, mesquite in the most extreme deserts and have done so for 8,000 years. So why would we turn our back on a tree like that that's literally the desert tree of life. And I've just had so much fun working with mesquite. We have a mesquite hammer mill in our garage and we bring it out three or four times a year and have community-based uh, mesquite pod millings. And we uh, help uh, get that mesquite flour. It's almost like a pastry flour. It's so delicious. Uh, you can compare it to uh, uh, chestnut flour or carob uh, flour or powder. It's, it's uh, excellent for pastries, also good for beers, and is in um, cappuccinos dusted on top of uh, uh, a cup of cappuccino in Tucson. So it's also kind of the iconic plan of the Tucson area along with the giant 
saguaro cactus. And so mm. all of these things reinforce our sense of place when we pay attention to the things right at our doorstep that can have value to our food and beverage uh, system. Yeah, I, I mean, bringing value to your local culture through these local foods and beverages, uh, I mean, local ingredients. And I love, you know, I, I love mesquite as that example. I guess I'm thinking about what you might suggest for somebody living anywhere, especially in an urban center, since that's where I'm, I'm speaking to you from. Um, what could we do to reconnect? Or I mean, what, what are some of the proactive things that we could do to, to have a more resilient and diverse food and beverage system that we could actually take action f- from our urban centers? Well, I love that question. And I should say right off the bat, I'm not some kind of local food Nazi like uh, a couple of the comic characters in Portlandia a few years ago who wouldn't touch anything that isn't from more than three miles away. (laughs) So I'm not dogmatic about this. I think in (laughs) the LA Basin, you have such an extraordinary diversity of cultures with knowledge about fermented beverages that you can really draw on there that you're primed to um, absorb the cultural uh, traditions in a place like LA, probably better than any other place in the U.S. because there's so many grocery stores of different ethnicities that feature these things. So I see valuing that as much in an urban setting as people in my rural setting can value all the different native food plants here. I, I just think it varies where we are. You know, there, there's so many things right. in the California uh, foothills and along the ocean front that you can draw on that makes L.A. cuisine and Ensenada taco cuisine unique. <laughs> and each place that we are, we don't need to copycat another place. We can just draw upon the great diversity of things that we have culturally and naturally at our own doorstep. Yeah, I love that. I, you know, this is a sort of a random question, but it's almost Thanksgiving. Um, how do you how do you feel about Thanksgiving? Do you have any traditions or thoughts that you have about Thanksgiving? It's actually the the holiday that I've loved the most since I was a child. Yeah, and me too. it's always because um, my Lebanese American family did sort of Thanksgiving fusion dinners where we'd have. Um, a turkey and a roasted lamb that had been butchered that morning with raw lamb meat and and then uh, uh, kibbeh and other lamb dishes alongside the turkey. And I I love that we let our cultural diversity back into Thanksgiving. I've helped uh, Indian communities here do um, teachings all fall long of harvesting wild plants and and uh, grinding or preparing uh, cultivated crops that are part of their tradition. And then on Thanksgiving Day, the grade school students make a meal with all the foods that their community used before the pilgrims arrived in North America. And so we can sort of flip Thanksgiving on its head that it's not about colonization and imperialism, but about what we have in our own communities that we can celebrate through food and beverage and communal celebrations. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I, I try to reclaim it rather, like, like you said, uh, as, as a beautiful thing rather than a reminder of colonialism and exploitation, um, bringing back some of those, you know, or not bringing back, but, uh, Redefining it, I guess, like you said. Redefining um, it, that's right. It, it's I like that term, flipping it on its head, because yeah. none of us really tolerate that colonial mentality anymore, but it's, it's hard to um, uh, rid an entire holiday from it, but to give our, ourselves some juxtapositions where we remember and learn from that history rather than blindly accepting it as a... As a foregoing conclusion, I think, is the game that's fun to play. Well, it sounds like a lot of your work has has been making connections um, and overcoming prejudices between people as much as it is in, in foods and culture, you know, the, culturally through foods. Do you, 
have any hope for America that in that sense, in terms of our ability to overcome current divides? And, and if so, where do you see that? Well, I wrote a book on that topic called Food from the Radical Center about yeah. four years ago that presaged how deep the divide is in our country now, which is just heartbreaking to me as, as it is to most of us that neighbors don't even talk to neighbors anymore just because of their political ideologies. And, and so the Food from the Radical Center book is really about efforts to, uh, between Democrats, Republicans, faith-based and science-based people of different ethnicities to bring back things like the Mission Olive and Mission Grape in Southern California that have been there for 400 years or the heirloom turkeys in the Midwest. About 10 years ago, uh, when I was on the slow food arc of taste, we seeded great American picnics all over the United States at Thanksgiving time, where we celebrated the heritage foods and beverages of our own locality. And what we Mm. found is those efforts brought together Democrat and Republican faith-based and science-based perspectives so that everyone could... uh, help restore some of these foods back to our landscapes. And so in California, a dinner might have been focused on mission grapes and mission olives and the wonderful acorns and and, uh, vegetables that you have. In the Midwest, it might be uh, the heirloom turkeys and the cranberries and the uh, many rare breeds of livestock that Midwestern farmers nearly lost that they're bringing back again. In the Deep South, the Cajun and Creole cooking that was imperiled by Hurricanes Rita and and, uh, the oil spill. We work to use these holidays to renew our covenant with those foods and the food producing landscapes that they come from. And hard ciders and, and local wines were part of those celebrations. And so I think we need to have something like a great American picnic in every community that reminds us what the unique beverages and uh, food ingredients are of our own home place and make that part of our own cultural identity or multicultural identity. And that's an incredibly enjoyable effort that I think when we participate in that, it helps heal these political and ideological divides that we've had for so long that sometimes farmers markets are the only places that Democrats and Republicans talk to one another anymore. (laughs) And so I think we need to use food and beverage for their healing qualities that, that we all love to eat. We love to drink. We love to have, uh, the congenial conversations that come when we do that. And that allows us to uh, put aside our differences and, and come together for common joys. Yeah, I love that. And, you know, thank you so much for, for sharing your time and wisdom on this. I wonder if maybe as a, a send off for somebody who's just getting to know you, uh, what would you recommend ter- that they check out in terms of a book that you've written or, or anything as, as something especially relevant to today as you know, that it would be also a great way to, to begin to know your work. Well, thank you. There's uh, three books that I'll mention real briefly, the food from the radical center that is case studies of how this uh, reviving beverages and foods work has brought together people in communities from different backgrounds My most recent book is called Jesus for Farmers and Fishers, uh, Justice for All Who Have Been Marginalized by Our Current Food System. And even though that sounds like an inherently Christian book, it's talking about the parables uh, that help people in the Middle East from all backgrounds survive an existential food and farming crisis uh, 2,000 years ago. So I think it's of interest to people more than just those who uh, see Jesus as a prophet. And then finally, a book that I did uh, with Slow Food USA and American Livestock Breeds and many beverage makers that's called Renewing America's Food Traditions. 
and that is a profile of the most distinctive and endangered beverages and foods region by region in North America. Well, that sounds great. Yeah. Yeah. You have been very active in the the food justice um, and and farm worker justice. uh, You know, I mean, you've done a lot of work in those areas. I I wish we could talk about that to some extent, but maybe I'll just ask you a hard question. (laughs) Um, More, I've talked about this with lots of people and I, I wish that I had a way to do more. And, and I wonder if there's a perspective shift that I need. And I'm wondering if you have a sense having worked in this space for so long that you could talk about how I and others could combat perspectives inside ourselves. Well, just keep in mind that the people who work in our fields that literally bring us our daily bread and wine are those most likely to have to go to a food bank to feed their own family. And to me, that's a national tragedy. And one that we need to resolve by policy, first of all, to get farm workers and their advocates on every state agricultural commission, every farm board, the Farm Bureau has to quit being a white organization and open up its diversity in our state to the 22 Uh, sets of immigrants from various countries, the refugees that have swept into our country, welcome them and see them part of the solutions to our farm system. And so I think every time that we advocate for immigrant and indigenous farmers and orchard keepers and beverage makers, we're all enriched by that. We're impoverished when we remain in isolation from the people most in need in our food system. We are impoverished, not just them. Yeah. Well, that's a a really good way to end, I think. And I really appreciate your time. It's, It's really been a pleasure to talk with you. Thank you so much, Gary. What wonderful questions. And thank you for your thoughtfulness and uh, blessings to all of your listeners who deeply care about these topics. Uh, I just think uh, this kind of dialogue is what can help heal us all in this difficult time in our own country. So thank you. Thank you.